comes up. Uh, Dr. Mood is our president this year. Um, so a little bit about um, Jim would be that he did a, a BSc in biochemistry at St Andrews, I won't say what year, uh, followed by a PhD at Queen's Mary in London. Um, he then came to Sheffield to do a postdoc in 1998, but he swiftly headed off to New York, which was a lot better, to do another postdoc at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Um, but he was lured back in 2005 with a lecture <laughs> in chemical biology at Sheffield. Um, his main areas of interest are in enzymatic mechanisms, specifically for photosynthesis, which he sort of followed from his PhD all the way through. So um, without further ado, for more information, I'm going to hand you over to you. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Right, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and to have, have a chance to talk to you all about some of my own interests and maybe tell you some stories about what I hope is interesting chemistry. So it is, I have to say before I kick off, it's actually always very flattering to be asked to do this. It is especially flattering to be asked to do this for a second time. Does that suggest you didn't make a horrible mess of it the first time round? And so I was sitting there thinking, wow, oh, that's really very gratifying, isn't it? And then I realised and started counting up on my fingers and realised that everyone who'd been to my last talk has now graduated. So I'm afraid you've only got yourselves to blame. So, those of you who are at the seminar this afternoon will know where my last minute subtitle is coming from. But that's not really what I'm going to talk to you about today. The, come on in, come in, come in, come in. Room for more. So, the real subtitle that came to me, unfortunately, after I told you what we're going to talk about, is this old saw, especially that appears in biochemistry courses. It's the line that if it's true in E. coli, it's true in elephant. So if it's true in the simple, single-cellular single model organism that we use, it's true in the largest and most charismatic of eukaryotes. Okay? There is one biochemistry. We have a unity of biochemistry. So I think this was Jacques Monod's line. And it seems reasonable to wonder if this is well, even remotely true. Is this a useful line or is it just stuff and nonsense? So, to try and think about this, to run through it, it seemed to me like it might be a sensible plan to pick a metabolic pathway and run through and look to see, is it the same all the way through or is there wild variation? And having heard the introduction, I suspect there's absolutely no surprise at all in the pathway I'd like to talk to you about today, which is porphyrin biosynthesis. Actually, as we'll see in a moment, strictly speaking, modified tetrapyrrole biosynthesis, but we can be pedantic in a second. Okay, I know, or in fact, I really deeply hope that, allow me to just pause. No, don't worry, come in. It's essential to get your tea before we start. So, porphyrins. I hope most of you know about these your famous reading about the subject, you will have come across them. The classical canonical example is, of course, heme. Cofactor involved in electron transport, in various reactions involved in oxygen transport, particularly in xenobiotic metabolism, is a classic story. So the cytochrome is P450 breaking down the foreign drugs in the body. And also, the example that everyone probably learns about in school, transporting oxygen around the body in your blood. We'll come back to blood in a second. Probably the more important modified tetrapyrrole is chlorophyll. Notice, I'm going to call them modified tetrapyrroles because it's correct, as these are no longer tetrapyrroles and we have the extra isocyclic E ring appearing here. So chlorophyll is arguably depending on who you talk to, certain colleagues up in biochemistry will say this with a completely straight face, this is the most important molecule on the planet. Absolutely all life on Earth depends on it, okay. through solar energy transfer. 
And molecules like this, or like this, are embedded in huge matrices of proteins, photosystems. My computer will actually show me it. Let's give this a second. So we have these huge arrays of tetrapyrroles embedded inside a protein matrix. Okay. Ideally suited for light capture. We do have to wait for a minute for this to actually work. Just twist that round a bit. You can see there beauty modified tetrapyrroles embedded in a photosystem. So heme and chlorophyll, two vitally important cofactors. The other classic, which I think all chemists love, or at least I hope you do, is vitamin B12, this beast here. Okay. Heavily involved in methyl transfer reactions. It is Fortunately for you, not going to be a major topic of my talk, but I have to put it in. Again, embedded in enzyme active sites, crystal structure here of an enzyme called glutamate mutase, just a small, small fraction of it. And you can see vitamin B12 embedded in here. So those are the three headline species that I think all of you will know about already. However, there are more. And the more, the extra ones are also desperately important. We have this chap here. Is that right? Thank God, yes, that is right. That is cyrocheme. An absolutely essential cofactor for, for just two enzymes. So there's only two enzymes out there that use this. Nitrite and sulfide reductases. This might seem like, I don't know, this might seem to you like an odd, obscure little part of biochemistry, but <coughs> every nitrogen, every biological nitrogen, every biological sulfur in your body has touched one of these rings. Okay. If I've got my microbial geochemistry right. Again, critically important, we will come back to this one later. And just to round up, we also have coenzyme F430 okay, involved in production of methane. Okay. And no one, to my knowledge, has any idea of how this is made in nature. The biosynthetic pathway is entirely unknown. Give or take. Essentially entirely unknown. Okay. Sorry, this is F430 just embedded in the active site of coen coenzyme M reductase, the enzyme it lives in. But we'll just move on fairly quickly. So, the porphyrins, the modified tetrapyrroles, a huge group of desperately important pigments involved in an impressive variety of biological reactions. Okay. Not everyone, not every organism makes all of them. You, for example, are not all green. Don't make fun of it. So we have some species that make one thing, some species that make another, spread across a huge range of organisms. So this seems to me, although I'm hopelessly biased in favor of these molecules, this seems to me to be an interesting test case to look at to try and see just how much unity there is in biochemistry. So, to talk about porphyrin biosynthesis, we have to start, I suppose we have to start at the beginning. And so our story takes us back to New York again, but this time in the 1940s, well before I got my first degree, thank you. And to a young biochemist called David Schemann, or a young chemist if you prefer. And his job, or the job he'd been tasked with, was determining the lifespan of a red blood cell. This is not a total digression, by the way. I will come back to the point in a second. So how long do red blood cells live in your body? How would you measure it? Stick a stopwatch in one of them. So at the time, I believe the estimate was 30 days, give or take. How long people thought red blood cells lived. And it was Shemin's job to try and get a better estimate. 
So naturally enough, his approach was synthetic, or at least to start with. And what he or his collaborators did is they synthesized roughly 66 grams of isotopically labeled glycine, which he then ate. As you do. The idea being that you then track the mass distribution of his proteins over time and see how long it takes all the label to wash out of his blood. In fact, the experimental design was slightly more arduous than I make it sound. Because I don't know, have you ever, well, I'd be stunned if you'd ever sat down and looked at 66 grams of isotopic label glycine and considered eating it. <laughs> Trust me, it's quite a lot of glycine, and it's not very appetizing. So let me clarify, it doesn't look very appetizing, I have not tried this. So his feeding protocol, or the chow protocol for Sherman, was that instead of eating it all at once, he would eat at a rate of one gram an hour for 66 hours. So presumably getting up on the hour, every hour, having his glycine snack, and then going back. Anyway, never mind, that's, that is a digression. So he, ate, he had the glycine, he ate it, and then for a long, respectable number of days afterwards, he took blood samples from himself, okay, and then went off to a, what I presume for the time must have been a prototype mass spec, analyzed the material. Now, as you would expect, most of the glycine ended up in proteins, as his experimental design was obviously aimed at finding out. But rather to his surprise, when they finally got round to analysing the human, sorry, the human that he'd got from his blood, he found that some of the label had ended up in the organic cofactor. So some of the glycine, well actually in fact, all of the glycine, had ended up inside his heme. So use of that tracer have provided the first crack in understanding how porphyrins were made. It wasn't what he was expecting to happen, it was a diversion into the field of porphyrin biosynthesis. It had to be because it started all off. So Shem's work was very rapidly followed up on, in particular in England, by Helen Muir and I think it was Alfred Neuberger. Okay. Shemin recognised the importance of what he was doing and followed up himself, <coughs> moving on to working on blood from birds rather than his own material, and it was very quickly shown that, or they very quickly inferred, bear with me, that this species here, delta amino levulinic acid, was <coughs> an intermediate in the biosynthesis of heme. Okay. This was intuition, they didn't know it at the time, they had to make it, and the theory they came up with was the carbons in red that you see here were derived from succinate, and those in black and the nitrogen came from glycine. So just to put this chap into context, if we show this in heme here, you can see that we have two delta ALAs, sorry, amino levulinic acids. I will just start calling it ALA, just bear with me for each ring. Okay. And you can see the pattern as we go round. This is the A ring, the B ring, the C ring. The D ring's a bit funky. That's the story for another time. So, this is our reaction, or at least an overview. We have glycine. This is succinyl-CoA, the true substrate of the enzyme. The enzyme catalyzing the reaction is ALA synthase, and this is ALA at the end. This is the true first intermediate in porphyrin biosynthesis. And as maybe the last slide suggested to you, we go on, we dimerize, we get to make a pyrrol. Yep, we do have a pyrrol. And you can see again here quite clearly where the two ALAs have gone. And that pyrrol then moves on through a number of steps and we form this chap here. So uroporphyrinogen 3, okay. notice we're still nowhere near a porphyrin here. Okay. This isn't conjugated all the way around. 
but this is the last common intermediate in heme, chlorophyll, F430, cyroheme, B12, heme D1, etc., etc., biosynthesis. And I think it's entirely fair, skipping back a bit, that this pathway is now known as the Sherman pathway. And this is the textbook pathway. So if you look into your biochemistry textbook, the one that I recommend to you in the second year, this is what you'll see. In fact, just while writing this, I looked into every biochemistry textbook I could find in my office, and they all showed this one. They all showed this mechanism or this pathway. And there the story rested for about 30 years. We knew, or we know how ALA is made. until it became clear that a number of bacteria and some photosynthetic organisms completely lack ALA synthase. And in actual fact, these organisms use glutamic acid as our starting material for ALA. Now, this reaction well, as you might guess, a series of reactions, requires ATP, so it needs a biological energy source, and it also requires NADH. And also, I must say what I think is a killer clue, if you add an enzyme, so if, say you take an extract from an organism that does things this way, and add an enzyme called ribonuclease, RNAs A, that digests RNA. This inhibits ALA synthesis, or ALA synthesis, I beg your pardon. So there's a critical role for RNA. And as we'll see, there's a role for transfer RNA. Rather on. Inhibited by RNAs. Okay, so. Actually, let's just look at some raw data, well, some data extracted from a review here. If you take, this is just the transfer RNA, more the, the jargon here, you can get full synthesis from glutamate, and also you can make glutamyl tRNA, as you'd expect. You treat with RNAs A, digest all the RNA, nothing. So is the RNA just activating an enzyme? Well, no, maybe not. Because if you remove the three prime CCA acceptor arm, so the part of a transfer RNA that actually hangs on directly to the amino acid, you also get no ALA synthesis. If you return it, you restore quite a respectable proportion. So it does appear that there's a real role for glutamyl transfer RNA as an intermediate. Okay. We'll skip the last two lines, they're not relevant to the story. So if that's the case, we then, we've also been able to rationalize the role of ATP in this reaction. Because you need ATP for the tRNA ligase that's going to synthesize your glutamyl tRNA. So that makes sense. The next step, takes our glutamyl tRNA down to this glutamate aldehyde here. Spare the details of that. And then, as you can see, all we need to do is do a bit of an exchange in these positions to produce our slightly unhelpfully flipped ALA here. So the 1-2 amino, amino mutase will catalyze this step. This enzyme is Actually, it's really quite cool. But to my interest, it doesn't need an external nitrogen source. Okay. So we really are exchanging these two positions directly rather than pulling out of a separate donor and solution. When the enzyme was purified, it came with a passenger, it came with a cofactor. And that was this species, well, that species, I beg your pardon, up there, pyridoxamine. Actually, probably pyridoxamine phosphate, but 
extraction procedures, etc., etc., suggesting that it's this nitrogen here and this species embedded in the enzyme that directly attacks the aldehyde, giving us a diamino intermediate in the enzyme reaction. I have to say, I think this is really quite cute. It means that the enzyme is not, in fact, directly transferring within one molecule. What it's doing is it's taking the nitrogen from, what should you say, the nth glutamate aldehyde that it meets, and then transferring that to the nth plus one in its active site. So it's a group transfer reaction, covalent intermediate of the enzyme, but it's transferring between successive substrates. Well, it amused me anyway. So, after all of that, we now have two well-established, separate, completely chemically distinct pathways to our core intermediate. We have the so-called C5 pathway, which starts from glutamate or glutamyl tRNA, if you like, and we have the Schemann pathway. Oh, actually, that's the point. To return to David Schemann, remember the whole point of his work was determining the lifespan of a red blood cell. Just to let you know, David Schemann's red blood cells last for 127 days. Significantly longer than the estimate at the time. In fact, sufficiently long that I believe there was a, a stand-up argument next to the mass spectrometer where the mass spectroscopist was convinced that he'd mislabeled his samples and he was convinced that the spectrometer was poorly calibrated. They would fall out like that. It turns out they were both right or both wrong, depending on how you like to look at it. And Schemann's estimate stands as a lifespan of a red blood cell. Oh, and no one here is from the safety committee. So despite eating in the lab, David Schemann continued to work for many years and died of home in his 80s. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So back to our story. We have two pathways spread across basically all of life. Well, actually, well, that's a complete lie. Just about everything, <coughs> vast majority of organisms on the planet make their ALA from glutamyl tRNA. The only ones that don't are a few weirdos, like us, anything with mitochondria, so mitochondrial enzyme, and a collection of alpha proteobacteria that are relatives of mitochondria. The exceptions, Eugelena is a freaky thing, we'll not talk about that, I think it's almost impossible to classify, and there might be some evidence in some plants that they can carry out both reactions in different tissues. But in the main, just about everything uses glutamyl tRNA. Right, so there we go. Our, that's far too early. Our hypothesis, however, is looking a little shaky, isn't it? looks like we do actually have some really quite serious variation even within a pathway picked almost at random. But never mind, let's just carry on and look a bit more apart from biosynthesis and we'll see how we get on. So as I said, uroporphyrinogen 3 is the last common intermediate in apart from biosynthesis. This is the great T-junction. One axis leads you on towards human chlorophyll, the other takes you down through an intermediate pre 2, off to B12, F430, and Cyrope. So, just for interest's sake, or my interest's sake, let's run with this and go on and make heme. So, uroporphyrinogen 3, to get to heme, we're going to have to do a lot of decarboxylations and oxidize the ring. Okay. So, let's see that. We take Uroporphyrinogen 3 to the next intermediate, coproporphyrinogen 3. I love these names, I have to tell you. So we, to get there, we have to decarboxylate, four successive decarboxylations. Incidentally, if you're looking at enzyme catalyzed decarboxylations, the general pattern you expect to see for most of them is you have somewhere to shuffle the electrons beta 
the CO2 you're removing. And in this case, we protonate in the ring to form aluminium, and that's our electron sink. So anyway, we do that a few times, we are, end up with coprogen 3. So, we're not quite there yet. We've still got an additional two CO2s to get rid of. We need to get these down to vinyls to end up with protoporphyrinogen 9. So, actually this entire slide could be viewed as an example of an alternative pathway, but it's, it's a bit of a cheat. So there are two enzymes, or two types of enzyme that catalyze this reaction, aerobic and anaerobic. Okay, completely different mechanisms. The, but it doesn't really affect the hypothesis because you might expect aerobic and anaerobic systems to behave quite differently. You don't have oxygen, you might have to elaborate. So the anaerobic enzymes are very well understood. They catalyze, they use a radical base mechanism. Okay, so these are so-called radical SAM enzymes. And work in these has really been carried out in the last 15, 20 years, and this is quite well understood. The oxygen-dependent decarboxylation, I'm afraid, is a bit, well, is anybody's guess. It's not mechanistically well understood, at least by me, and I'd really better not say anything about it. We don't even know if some tallow enzyme. Ah, never mind. Anyway, look. So we can, however, definitely decarboxylate, even if we're not sure how it happens. Okay. And then our final step is catalyzed by protoporphyrinogen oxidase to take PP protoporphyrinogen here down to protoporphyrin 9, which should be looking very familiar to you as almost team. All we need to do is take this chap, deprotonate twice, and feed it iron. Okay. Enzyme catalyzed, the enzyme is very okay. An enzyme some of you are familiar with. So, Actually, let's just see that in kind of general chicken bar form. That takes you from Euro 3 right down around here in what's becoming known as the classical heme biosynthesis pathway. Okay. So this was all worked out, at least the nature of the intermediates, a number of years ago now. Okay. So it's very well established by chemistry. The first cracks started to appear in about 1998 when it became apparent that some organisms quite happily making urogen 3 lacked successive enzymes taking us on all the way around the path. Skipping ahead it became clear that these were the archaea and also denitrifying and sulfite reducing bacteria. Switching back to our T-junction slide, these guys make heme, definitely, they make heme, but they lack any of the enzymes involved in the pathway here. But if you remember cyrocheme and nitrite and sulfate, sulfite reductase, they clearly have the option to go down around here. So in the story, actually, sorry, just an aside, I should point out, absolutely none of this is my work. None of this has anything to do with me at all. I'm just a spectator. It's a story I enjoy, so I thought I'd tell you it. Okay. This particular work was done fairly recently, actually down, well, down in London, in Queen Mary by chance, not for anyone I work for, and also out in Kent. So the pathway goes, or is now thought to go through cyroheme. Reminder, this is cyroheme here. Notice we have a slight change in the A and B rings, but C and D are looking reasonably familiar. So, what are we going to do? Well, let's fix the C and the D rings. What happens first is we decarboxylate to afford us the 1218 decarboxy species. 
good evidence for this. Now all we need to do is deal with the northern end of the molecule. And we have a beast of a reaction that gives us iron copropyrin 3. Notice we're almost at heme now. We've just got these chaps to deal with here, which happens in the final step, giving us heme. This is, well, it's actually a bit vague. There's, by my count, there's three papers on this. So it hasn't been looked at in very many species. But the, sorry, it hasn't been looked at in biochemical detail, actually, in the lab. But I believe the story is that most of the sequence analysis suggests that these are also radical based enzymes. Okay, so they're radical sign enzymes. So it's the well understood variant of the same decarboxylation of the classic pathway. And that was where the matter rested. We now have two alternative pathways from urogen 3 taking us to heat. Okay. The so-called classical pathway and the rather novel alternative pathway of humanizing. So just within one metabolic pathway picked almost at random, we have two well-characterized redundant variants. Our hypothesis is looking really quite shaky now, isn't it? So anyway, there the matter rested. Until last Monday. When paper, actually still a paper in press in PNAS was published, quite clearly demonstrating that gram-positive bacteria, including some really quite unpleasant pathogens, lacked the enzyme needed to do this. Okay. This incidentally makes the name the alternative pathway. It's entirely accurate, but maybe a little bold. So, What's going on here then? So it turns out, to cut a very long story short, we are missing all of these steps. We also have no plausible pathway to go around in the alternative. <coughs> so the story is, or the suggestion is, we have an additional, I got this right. Yes, I have. So we have an additional species here. So we have a coproporphyrinogen 3 oxidase that takes us to coproporphyrin 3. You have to be quite careful with these names. Okay. So we now have a true porphyrin here, okay. conjugated all the way around the pyrrols, but still decorated with CO2s in positions where we wouldn't expect to see them in most of our normal porphyrin. This species, okay. uh -huh. so I'm just searching the audience. Excellent. The one project student in my lab this is relevant to isn't actually <laughs> <laughs> Ah, well, never mind. So this species is the substrate for some ferriculatases, gram-positive ferriculatases, in fact. And we can produce this species here. And this absolutely works. It goes like clappers. And then all we need to do is remove here and here to give us this species. Notice the enzyme that carries this out is absolutely not, well, no, actually, I cannot be definite here. It is almost certainly not a radical SAM enzyme. It has, lacks the characteristics, <coughs> it lacks the characteristic iron sulfur cluster. Mechanistically, we don't know how it does it. The only clue that we've got is there's a flame, there may be a flame involved. And that's from me reading, I actually found the paper this morning. So that's from quick read this afternoon. I can't tell you any more than that. I am open to suggestions. So, okay. So this leaves us now with a slide of chicken wire. 
So what turned from a really nice, simple, clear, roundabout pathway takes us to a number of branching alternatives and endless variety in how we can catalyze what seem to be relatively simple metabolic reactions. So, so if you've ever read the, what you call them, markers guidelines for second and third year lab reports, you're, you're asked to clearly establish a hypothesis, present some results, and then draw a conclusion. And seeing as I'm here, I may as well do that. We had the hypothesis of this, what's true in E. coli is true in elephants. What are our results? Well, E. coli and elephants, I beg your pardon, go back one, both will use the classical heme biosynthetic pathway. There is nothing odd there. However, E. coli, being a more or less ordinary organism, will use glutamyl tRNA as a source to form delta amino levulinic acid. You, however, and elephants, have mitochondria, so you use the Shemin pathway instead. So quite clearly, I can only come to the conclusion that, well, some of the times, maybe. I think I'm going to finish there. Thank you very much.